I've got no pedaling power left in my legs. I'm having to hoof it. I'm at the 10 mile mark and I still haven't found this village or the remains of it. And I still have at least three miles to go until I get back to my car. Probably four. If I don't make it, I just want you to deliver my message to the world. Diets are conversion therapy for fat people. Help me, they're trying to convert me. <laughs> that is all. <laughs> Hey, what is up camera people? Welcome back. It's been a couple weeks since that unfortunate event I had out here trying to find the lost town of Hamburg. Here's what happened when the camera wasn't rolling. As you saw in the previous video, I ended up taking the long way around the trails, causing me to put in 11 miles when I hadn't been on my bike in almost a year. Now obviously, as you saw, not all of those miles were on the bike. Some of them were hiking too but I'd put such an abnormal strain on my legs that they started cramping up while I was walking back to the mothership. You should have seen it. I was literally squat walking sideways in the middle of the cycling, cycling trail, holding onto the bike the whole way, trying to make it back to uh, the nearest trailhead so I could call for a rescue. <laughs> I must have looked like I was trying to take a walking shite. Hang on a sec, we got a jet going overhead. Maybe they were at the archery range or something, I don't know. Bush Wildlife does have a couple of nice archery ranges, but yeah, I had to have them come pick me up and take me back to the mothership. While I was waiting for them, I made a painful attempt at trying to sit down and rest my feet and legs. But when I was halfway down to the ground, I heard a rustling sound next to me. I look over, there's this huge ass snake sliding up right beside me. Now, I don't know snakes, other than they activate my automatic nope protocol. And don't start lecturing me about the shapes of their eyes or the locations of their assholes. For obvious reasons, I was not wearing my glasses at that point. And equally obvious should be the fact that I wasn't about to stick my face down there close enough to find out if the snake was poisonous or not. So needless to say, my fat ass reversed course and I took off in the same direction as that snake. Only I took off at about the same speed as a constipated old man waddling to the toilet. <laughs> Now, obviously, I'm not my mom. Knowing her crazy countryfied ass, she would not have given two shits about that snake other than to grab that son of a bitch and yeet it out into the trees somewhere. I've seen her do it. <laughs> now, as for me, I wasn't raised a country boy. My, I'm only a convert, which means when I see a snake, I run and scream like a bitch. And I'm not too proud to admit to that either. <laughs> Anyways. While I was waiting for Angio and AJ, another cyclist pulls up in his truck, obviously more professional and more prepared than I was. And he starts hooking me up with bottled water as I'd already ran through all of my water supplies, 
bottled water, half gallon jug. He starts hooking me up with these electrolyte packs. And those packs hit hard too. By the time I was done with the first one and through my first bottle of water, um, the cramps were already gone in my legs. And yeah, I mean, like I said, it hit hard. Who knows, along with Angio and AJ, um, that, that, that dude over there, he, he might have actually helped save my life because I'm pretty sure that despite my preparations and all the water I drank, I think I was partially dehydrated while I was out here. So on the off chance you're seeing this kind sir, thank you for your help. Anyways, Angio and AJ zipped me back to the mothership. I came back to pick up my bike went home to recover and put together part one of this video as well as to do further research on the location of the town of Hamburg. Damn, I can go for a hamburger right about now. <laughs> Anyways, while I was digging around, I found a blog online which included GPS coordinates to various parts of Hamburg. But these coordinates looked like nothing I've ever seen before. It turns out the blog's author may have been using a mil-spec GPS. So, I had to find a dependable app that could convert those coordinates to something my own navigation apps could recognize. Well, I got all that done. Now I'm back in the field and I'm ready to finally be able to present to you the remains of the town of Hamburg, Missouri. But first, make sure you smash that like button for me. Your tubby boy could have died out here trying to show you this stuff. The least you could do is like the video. Remember, if you don't smash that like button, you suck harder than Madonna trying to win votes for her preferred political candidate. Oh yeah, I said it. And if you're new here, feel free to subscribe to see more Missouri history, more Missouri hauntings, and more, of course, recreational douchebaggery. YouTube's analytics show that less than 3% of my viewers are also subscribers, so do your tubby wubby a little favor and subscribe, will ya? I'd love to see my channel break 400 subs by first. I know it's a far cry from the fan base I used to have when I all I did was those Silent Hill parodies, but you, you can help me get it up again. I can't believe I just fucking said that. <laughs> Anyways, let's do this shit. <laughs> The founding of the towns of Hamburg, Howell, and Tunerville, Missouri can be traced back as far as the 1830s, but one would have to look as far back as 18th century Europe to understand exactly how these three Missouri towns came to exist. In 1799, a gifted French military tactician became de facto ruler of the French Republic, setting himself on a path which nearly led to total domination of Europe. History will remember this Frenchman as Napoleon Bonaparte, and his conquest of Europe was unlike anything the world has seen since the times when Asia and Eastern Europe were ravaged by one of my own ancestors, Temujin, who you might know by his more commonly recognized name, Genghis Khan. What later became known as the Napoleonic Wars not only led to mass loss of life, the likes of which would not be seen again on the European continent, until the rise and fall of Hitler's so-called Third Reich. But it also led to mass emigration of Europeans either seeking refuge from a war-torn land or seeking to either escape compulsory military service themselves or protect their draft-aged children from being conscripted into a fighting a war that, by all indications, they had very little chance of returning home from. Now, Napoleon might have died in 1821, but the aftershocks of his military campaigns were felt for decades. Culturally, economically, he left many a European seeking greener pastures. Known as the New World and the melting pot of nations, America caught many of these immigrants, and this included many immigrants of Germanic heritage. In fact, one needs not look far in the United States to see German cultural influences on our everyday lives. Brewing, architecture, brewing, music, brewing. In fact, this is how America came to be home to such influential business magnates and entrepreneurs as Levi Strauss, Franz Rudolf Wurlitzer, 
and St. Louis, Missouri's own Adolphus Bush and Johann Adam Lemp. Got that covered in case anybody sees the car just sitting here. It's what I also do do when I uh, go cycling in random places that are kind of unusual, out of the way. Nobody expects to see a car sitting there with a bike rack on it. Just leave a note. I can't find my dry erase board this time. I usually just use that. But yeah, anyways, let's do this. what I think they are. They sure are. I forget what they're called. Maybe somebody who paid attention in their uh, Red Dead Redemption tutorials might be able to tell me what this is. Angio showed me these one time. You pluck these leafy things out of them, and they're not actually leaves. Mmm. Mm hmm. They've got natural sugar in them. Kind of a small sample, but yeah, it's there. Okay. Well, I heard running water, but it stopped as soon as I stopped walking. Anyways. One of the issues I had last time, aside from my habit of making very poor decisions in choice of direction, <sighs> is that the Lost Valley Trail, the Hamburg Trail, all that, uh, circles around what remains of the ordnance works, while the actual remains of or the majority of the remains of the town of Hamburg are on the other side of 94 there. So, again, I've got the uh, GPS coordinates for various sites over there, but the pull-off, which was the first stop that I logged for, uh, or that I got the GPS coordinates for, uh, it's a pretty serious drop off of 94 and while I could get my car back there and probably do some undercarriage damage so I parked up at the Tunerville uh, trailhead and I'm gonna hike down the Hamburg trail heading in the direction that I should have taken last time and then just hop across 94 see Here's where I was last time. And I should have went that a ways last time, but I'm thinking, oh, okay. Well, that looks pretty scenic down there. I'm gonna go there. And hence, that is how my <sighs> horrible story begun. <laughs> but it's okay because obviously I survived and my fat ass is better for it or at least I hope my doctor thinks so hi doc bless me doctor for I have sinned I broke down and ordered a pizza last week please forgive me I couldn't help myself. 
it, it, it kept calling to me. It said, Tommy, Liebchen. <laughs> Even before being admitted to the Union in 1821, Missouri was a favorite place for German immigrants to settle down. While pioneers and immigrants of other ethnicities continued westward, many a German settler needed but to look at the rolling hills, lush landscapes, and fertile fields of the Missouri Territory to be reminded of home. In fact, 1824 saw the arrival of one such German immigrant named Gottfried Duden, who settled near the location of present-day Dutzau, Missouri. In 1826, he returned to Germany to tell everyone he knew that this new land was exactly like the Rhine, and that they should come build new lives in what he called the Missouri Rhineland. By 1830, German immigration to America had begun in earnest. Many were sold on their predecessor stories of the Missouri Rhineland, a place where hard-working German farmers could build new lives for their families, in a land which looked so much like the home they were forced to leave behind for one reason or another. As was common practice at that time, a settler or homesteader, in order to stake his claim, would be required to find a piece of unclaimed land, stake out the section he wanted, build a dwelling, and farm that land for at least a year in order to raise a viable crop thereby demonstrating his willingness to work and maintain that land. Once this was completed, the local government would officially certify that claim to be under the ownership of the claimant who had just spent the last year or so working that land. Not only was this a sweet deal for the 18th and 19th century American settlers, it was an especially good deal for migrants who had just left their homes far behind in a war-torn land in many cases, barely walking away with whatever the entire family could fit into a single trunk. It was also a common practice at the time for your average homesteader to leave his family behind in a safer, well-established community, sometimes as far away as New York, where America's most frequently used port of entry was at that time. While he would go out and stake his claim, build a home for his family, and turn his new land into a workable farm. Just think back to John Marston's epilogue in Red Dead Redemption 2, how he had the home all built up and the farm functioning long before Abby and Jack ever arrived. Yes, I'm watching where I'm stepping. But while I was looking for somewhere to step off the trail and take a piss, I accidentally found the Maids or the Madays Cemetery. I don't know how it's pronounced. You gotta be careful, I don't know where to step, except for this one little bunny calf coming through here. Oh, snap broke that off. Should be up there.
So here we've got Catherine, 1817 it looks like, to 1903, 1902. This one's a quote. I can't quite make it out. I'll have to freeze frame that and try to enhance it later. And this one is George, 1810 to do some backtracking. Uh, I used the GoPro app to set the time on the GoPro and it forced an update through on the camera before it would let me use the camera again. While it was doing that I couldn't switch to the navigator. I hadn't realized that while that was going on I had walked right past uh, where I needed to cross over across 94 to get to that uh, pull-off point and start my actual journey. So now I'm backtracking so I can do that. In the meantime, I'm going to shut the GoPro off for a little bit because it's getting hot and I don't want it to do what it did in the last video and stop recording video and just record audio. So let's save it for now. All right, so I've made it to the pull-off. Uh, I've got the navigator running. And yeah, I am right next to the highway here. I've got a trail going down in the trees about 270 yards east of me would be the, rem not the remains, but the original. Oh, look at these, one of those carnations. Anyways. Down this way. Ooh, damn. This is where the original site of the Hamburg schoolhouse is supposed to be. Ah, this is a hell of a creepy clearing. But I'm almost to the original roadbed as well. So this is conservation property still. It's right here. This is just where they run the utility poles. Technically, I don't even know if I'm supposed to be back here, but we will see what we will see. In all fairness, I will turn around at the first no trespassing sign. Or gunshot. Right. I'm 
getting close. But I'm not going that a ways. I'm going around this ways. I'm so glad for this hat. See, the funny thing is, as soon as I tapped the area that was about 300 yards off of the turnoff, it automatically brought up Hamburg school site. So obviously I'm not the first person to come looking for this stuff. Well, obviously, the person who uploaded all the GPS coordinates has been out here looking for it. Ooh! Damn. That would have been painful. Enjoy your hike. Ah. All right. Ooh. I can stand upright again. Yay. So the upside is I am now standing at the site, the location of the original Hamburg schoolhouse. The downside is the online sources are correct. If this is the right location, there are no traces left of it. I'm going to load up my next set of coordinates, which should lead me to the, um, what do you call it? the original Hamburg Road that went through town. But first... Getting back to St. Charles, though. While St. Charles itself was settled by the French in 1766, St. Charles County didn't exist until the War of 1812 began in, well, 1812. It was in this year that the Missouri Territory began to organize individual counties, such as St. Charles County, St. Louis County, Warren County, etc. In 1839, the settlement of Howell was founded by an educator named Francis Howell. It's funny, I'd always been under the impression that Francis and Howell were two different people. So I'd always referred to Francis Howell as Francis Howell instead of Francis Howell and no one ever noticed. The following year, in 1840, the town of Hamburg was settled. This time by a group of German immigrants, the original location of Hamburg was an ideal trading hub for local farmers, due to being located not only close to the Missouri River, but also being located along the Missouri-Kansas-Texas Railroad Line, or the MKT, 
which would much later become the Katy Trail. The main location of Hamburg changed in 1844 when its founders learned the true magnitude of a little magic trick the Missouri River likes to perform on an annual basis called seasonal flooding. 1844 was the year of the Great Flood of the Missouri River Valley, and the town's residents and founders quickly learned that the river, which served as one of the town's mercantile lifelines, could also spell the town's doom. Before 1844, Hamburg was one small town located below the bluffs overlooking the river and the MKT rail line. When they realized regular flooding was going to be an issue, much of the town was moved and rebuilt to top of the bluffs, for the most part leaving behind only the Hamburg train depot and a few steadfast residents who were unwilling or unable to relocate. This led to the town being divided into two segments, Upper Hamburg and Lower Hamburg. Because I don't want to spend the next three quarters of a mile squat walking through the woods. I am not in a Bethesda game. <laughs> I just reread the article and I'm supposed to be um, following a path that started next to that uh, metal gate up there by that uh, turn off, pull off, cut off area. what the hell that noise is. Sounds more like those maintenance people that were working on the uh, road about a half mile down. Because uh, again, I haven't seen any no trespassing signs, but I don't know if I'm supposed to be back here or not. Is a big fucking paw print. If y'all know what leaves that kind of paw print, let me know. So I got the strange feeling I don't want to find out while I'm out here. <sighs> Ugh. That just gave me the willies. So there's the metal gate. She said the trail starts next to the metal gate and is very obvious. Worn path is obvious. Walk 0.12 miles down the trail.
This is definitely a more tolerable path. Man, now I'm kind of sounding like Sean Connery in uh, Indiana Jones 3. All I need now is a Tootsie Roll and I can sound exactly like him. Guys, I just found what was making that uh, huge ass footprint. It's pretty creepy. I'm warning you, you little bugger. I am ready to, to defend myself. You're a cute little shit. <laughs> I'm gonna continue down the path. Got a road here and a road here and the path that I just came down. Now granted the compass and magnetometer in my phone isn't quite right, but it looks like this way is going to lead me to the original roadbed. So this right here would probably be the original dirt country road that led into town. So we're going to follow it. But first, got to pull my pants up and plug my charger in. Into the camera, I mean. Come on, man. Despite all the hardships endured by our pioneering ancestors here in Missouri, the Great Flood of 1844, the Cholera Outbreak of 1849, the invention of the postage stamp, the people of Hamburg stood strong, not only a testament to the state and thereby the nation that they were helping to build, but also as a testament to the hardy, steadfast lineage which they had brought with them from the Old World a durability and determination that one rarely finds outside of the Germanic clans, the West African tribes, the Nordic clans, or a pissed off Scotsman after someone has just insulted his mum. Life was good for the townsfolk of Hamburg and Howell. Hell, in 1881, Howell even opened up the Howell Institute, the grandfather of the Francis Howell School District. So both towns now had access to an accredited educational facility. This might also explain why during the filming of my original unpublished Randonautica video, the GPS said that I was in the Francis Howell School District while I was actually standing in the middle of the August Bush Wildlife Reserve. The location of the town of Howell now makes up a small portion of bush wildlife as the Bush Wildlife Reserve is actually made up of over 6,000 acres of lands originally acquired for the construction of the Weldon Spring Ordnance Works, but which seem to have gone unused in that project. Even when the Great Depression started in 1929, farming communities still fared much better than the cities. City folk relied mainly on meats and vegetables to be brought into the cities via train and wagon as not a lot of companies at the time were sold on the idea of the internal combustion engine, they still relied on the affordable, low-maintenance, horse-drawn carriage. 
while country folk and farmers had access to the foods they themselves were producing. Plus, with the scarcity of expensive fuels and high costs involved in acquiring long-range transportation at the time, combined with the seclusion of farming communities such as Hamburg, basically outside of the railroads, St. Charles County didn't even have direct roads connecting to the St. Louis area until the Daniel Boone Bridge was completed in 1937. So the idea of city folk raiding farms for food was a rather far-fetched idea especially when it was much easier to wait near the rail yards and just raid the produce trains as they rolled in. Hell, as a kid, I used to listen to the old folks tell stories of how they would raid the trains as they were pulling into Produce Row in North St. Louis. They made it sound less like providing for their starving families and more like harmless, jolly fun. Unfortunately, the true tragedy struck Howell, Hamburg, and Tunerville when Adolf Hitler declared war on the world. When Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in 1933, he set forth a chain of events that would forever change the social, political, and economical climates of the entire planet. For the first time in human history, each and every nation was vulnerable, whether they were involved in the war or not. Hey, what's going on? Did you put your wallet? No, it's uh, right here in my pocket. Definitely not me. Thanks, though. Bye. Right, catch, catch you later. <laughs> Bye. It's my boss. She might have a year or two on me, but uh, the phone makes her voice sound like she's twelve. <laughs> It's kind of funny. All right, so just past that uh, crossroad I was telling you about. So we're getting close. All right, so this could possibly be right here. The ravine that they say the folks of Hamburg used as one of their dumping grounds. It could be, or it could just be local hillbillies dumping tires. I don't know. Then again, I can't see hillbillies having uh, abundance of white walls. Like right down there. But yeah. So this could be the little ravine. It could also be the roadbed that I'm looking for. Then again, maybe not. I don't know. We're going to keep going though. All right, now over here is a much deeper ravine. One that I am definitely not trying to get into. And that's right across from where we just saw those tires at. So let's keep going. I'll tell you what though, once we get off that little game trail, this opens up into a nice little stroll. With a little side path right up there. Huh. Anyways, let me check the navigator and the notes.
Seeing war on the horizon, and that America's involvement was inevitable, the United States began to turn its manufacturing industries to a wartime footing. Home appliance factories were retooled to produce infantry equipment. Clothiers began to roll out uniforms, while textile factories produced tents and other types of canvas walled buildings. Automotive manufacturers retooled to produce armored vehicles, infantry transports, cargo trucks, and the like. This would also explain why, on occasion, you can still happen across an antique Jeep, which carries the badge of the Ford Motor Company. Because during wartime production, if your factory could make something that was needed on the front, it damned well made it, and copyrights and trademarks could go to hell. While the United States did have plenty of arms manufacturers like Remington Outdoor Company, Winchester Repeating Arms, Browning Arms, what it lacked was a large-scale producer of explosive ordnance. Alright, so the next set of coordinates are for what was actually supposed to be the town dump. Which should be that ways. Alright, somewhere down in that ravine there is the dumping ground. I'm not climbing down there this time of year. Honky don't play that. So, next set of coordinates. Now there's approximately one or two more sets of coordinates, including this one, before I wind up hitting the Katy Trail and following that over to my last set of coordinates. Now what I'm heading to now is actually supposed to be the Heck Roth Cemetery which is also near the remains of the John and Susan Beatty home. Now, I understand that the John and Susan Beatty home is the one that's rumored to still be standing, but that rumor is actually the cellar is still there as well as a covered well out back of it. Now this one's gonna take a few minutes to get there, so I'm gonna kill the camera so I can get a little more charge on it. World War I was known as a trench war. Men fighting men in the trenches, guns blazing. Aerial combat was present, but not overly so. And aside from an occasional pilot getting the bright idea to drop a hand grenade out of his cockpit from low altitude, aerial bombing was only theoretical at that time. And as for the tank, the tank was more of a novelty, a scare tactic, a large metal beast which was unleashed upon the battlefield to show enemy troops an unstoppable monster, though a monster which was primarily armed with machine guns. The same could not be said of World War II. Military aircraft by then had become much more sophisticated than their biplane counterparts from prior decades. These craft were designed with specialized classes in mind, and each class had a specific purpose, such as the bomber. Then there's the tank. Powerful, heavily armored, designed to combat other heavily armored vehicles of the same type. And all of these machines needed compact, high-yield explosive ordnance in order to be effective on the battlefield. And the United States required a facility capable of mass-producing the ordnance needed for its tanks and bombers, as well as for its naval and field artillery. But, military strategists also understood the need for seclusion and security. Building that facility too near the coastal regions would leave it susceptible to both sabotage and aerial bombardment, 
Hell, just look at the events of December 7th, 1941 as a prime example. The Japanese Imperial Navy proved without a doubt how easy it was to sneak up on and attack an American military installation. Early warning radar detection was still in its infancy at that time, and highly unreliable. And by the time ground spotters could positively identify incoming enemy aircraft, the attack would have been mere seconds from commencing. What the American military machine needed was an ordnance plant in the nation's heartland, beyond the range of enemy aircraft of the time, capable of mass producing the ordnance needed to keep America and her allies knee deep in all the boom booms and bang bangs their little hearts desired. The Council of National Defense had many places scouted, and the perfect location for the future ordnance works was discovered. It was isolated from the nearest cities, it was in the central United States, far from the coast, it had access to an established railroad line and freight depot, as well as access to a riverboat landing, in case it became necessary to move cargo or personnel via the waterways, and the area was rich in limestone which could be quarried for building material for the ordnance works. Unfortunately, three established communities stood in the way of this project. Equally unfortunate is the fact that established communities had never stopped the U.S. government before. Let me welcome you to the Roth Cemetery, the Heck Roth Cemetery. Now again, this one also doesn't have a lot to see. It's very overgrown. And I'm actually not going to walk very far into this one, because actually you can see. The headstones are very hard to find. A lot of them are on the verge of toppling, the ones that are still standing. And the last thing I want to do is be responsible for knocking one over. Let's just say that uh, I know somebody who accidentally toppled an obelisk at a uh, cemetery that you've seen me go to twice. And, yeah, he had a lot of bad luck shortly thereafter. Now, if that's the Heck Roth Cemetery, then about 100 feet down the way, on the same side, should be the Beatty House. Or what's left of it. Now somewhere up here, where I'm hearing all these noises, let me see here. Adolf and Rose Daniel House across the road between the cemetery and the Beatty House. So, but again, that's just another foundation kind of place. Let me see here. Because I'm not too good at measuring distances visually. I can measure millimeters by sight just fine, but distances is a different story. Guys, I wish you could seriously see this exactly as I see it right now. This seriously looks like something out of an old fantasy movie or, well, except for that beer can there. <laughs> Anyways. Alright. 
right about here is where the beady house should be. I gotta figure a way through that. Sadly, despite my best efforts, I have yet to have anything really real to show you yet. Ouch, that's definitely not the way I came through it. But oh well. Ooh. Yeah, tell me about it. I got droopy drawers again. That's what I get for losing so much weight winding up with my crotch right around my knees. My dear Mr. Secretary, under the provisions of the Act of September 9th, 1940, and upon the recommendation of the Council of National Defense and the Advisory Commission thereof, I hereby give my approval to the following project under the Wall Department Program for expediting production in connection with existing national defense programs. Construction of a TNT and DNT plant at Weldon Springs, Missouri, costing $14,500,000. Sincerely yours, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 17 October, 1940. By September of 1940, President Roosevelt had given his seal of approval for the National Defense Project which would create an ordnance factory at Weldon Spring, Missouri, acquiring 17,232 acres of land to do so. The only obstacles now were the construction of the ordnance works itself and, of course, getting rid of all the pesky people who owned the land where the ordnance works was to be built. And then it happened, that dreadful headline, $11 million for TNT plant. Those big black letters stood out like a smudge of dirt on a nurse's uniform. The article stated that a TNT plant was to be located in the southeastern part of St. Charles County. That's where we live. Surely they're not going to take this beautiful countryside and build a TNT plant. Yes, the article said some 18,000 acres of land would be acquired for that purpose. That will take in all of this part of the county. Better go over and see what my neighbor thinks of this. There must be some mistake. Everyone said it was a mistake. No one told us that this land might be taken for that purpose. Surely we would have heard something about it. Just one of those mistakes those city papers make nowadays. The Rape of Howell in Hamburg, Missouri. Written by Donald Muscany in 1978. Through the use of lowball monetary offers, legal threats, and eminent domain, also known in Missouri as outright land theft, the residents of Howell, Hamburg, and Tunerville were either bought out, chased out, or in some cases kicked out being given just three months to pack up their entire lives and the histories of their forebears, 
many times stepping out of their lifelong homes just in time for the demolition crews to set everything they ever knew ablaze the moment they walked out the door. Construction of the Weldon Spring Ordnance Works proceeded at such a rapid pace that by 1941, parts of the facility were already going into full production, pushing out TNT and DNT products at breakneck speeds, which I suppose was a good thing as not only was the United States able to build its own ordnance stockpiles, but in March of 1941, FDR had signed the Lend-Lease Bill, providing material aid to Great Britain in her fight against the Nazi invaders, as well as providing some aid to the Soviet Union and China. But back home in Missouri, the waiting game had just begun for some 700 farmers, businessmen, and their families. So I don't need coordinates yet. Now my task is to just follow this trail down to the Katy Trail. Now again, there won't be anything but uh, possibly a uh, foundation if I'm lucky, but uh, where this trail meets the Katy, uh, there's supposed to be the uh, location of the old Hamburg train de depot. It was one of the advantages of the location of this town, aside from being so close to the river, was when they ran the KT line through here, um, the town was both connected to the railroad industry and the uh, riverboat industry. Which is also another reason why um, the federal government wanted this area so badly for the uh, Weldon Spring Ordnance Works. No, I'm not tweaking. I have a really bad habit of catching spider webs with my face and eyes. But yeah, anyways. The Ordnance Works was very well connected to the riverboats and the uh, railroads as well. Ooh, now we're getting muddy. It's okay, I'm wearing my farting boots. These boots were made for farting. Alright. Now, ooh. Okay, so I'm definitely close to the Katy. I'm close enough to the Katy that there's uh, somebody has abandoned a small boat here. I'm gonna check that out sometime, see if it's salvageable. <laughs> Anyways. All right. A footbridge. stagnant enough. Well, that part isn't, but the other part is. Maybe this is why the mosquitoes are so bad back here. Voices. Cyclists. Katie Trail. Yep. There we go. Ooh, cute touch. Heavy equipment. Alright. Alright. 
Looks like I just found the Katie. I'm telling you right now, if I follow that path, I'm gonna find a shrine to Azura over there. I guarantee it. land going over here. So it's a little bit of runoff from the Missouri River. I've already got an interesting video planned for the Missouri River, but first I need a couple people to help me out with handling the camera on the shoreline. Oh, hey. The Lewis and Clark Expedition. Kickapoo Indians. I should have kicked Lewis and Clark's poo right back across the river. From 1941 to 1945, the Weldon Spring Ordnance Works cranked out TNT and DNT explosives at speeds which would have made any powder monkey's toes curl. Four production lines dedicated to TNT products, plus two more dedicated to DNT, meant that our Allied artillery, tanks, and bombers would be well fed throughout the entire war. And still, many residents of Howell, Hamburg, and Tunerville waited for what the government had promised them when they kicked them off their lands. But as anyone who studies American history can tell you, the U.S. government is not known for its willingness to keep the promises it makes to Americans. I owned a farm in the area consisting of 161 acres, with this new modern improvements on it, built in 1936 to 1940. The farm was in the outlaying area, and it was never used for war purposes. The buildings and fences were destroyed, and the land was rented for agricultural purposes. Payments were withheld on half of the contracts due to the difficulties with the War Department. The property was taken over by the War Department in the fall of 1940, and we were paid in the late summer of 1945, but we were forced to go to Supreme Court for a decision. We have been without a home all this time. Now when we were paid, there was such inflation that very little could be bought with the money acquired from the sale of the farm. After all those huge expenses, the courts, attorney's fees, etc. were all taken off. We've been without a home all this time, and we'd like very much to reacquire ours. What's the procedure should we follow? Well, we feel that we were part of the war machinery that helped bring the war to a successful ending, and that our contribution was no small one. We feel that the property on the outlying area was devoted to agricultural purposes should be returned to the former owners to enable them to start life over again. T. Woodson, date unknown. Wartime production of TNT and DNT led to nitroaromatic contamination of soil, groundwater, and springs in the area. 
requiring years of environmental remediation between 1945 and 1955, when 200 acres of the former Ordnance Works were transferred to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission for construction of the Weldon Spring Uranium Feeds Material Plant, later known as the Weldon Spring Chemical Plant. This new uranium plant operated from 1957 to 1966, converting uranium ore into uranium tetrafluoride, uranium trioxide, and uranium metal, and also processed small amounts of thorium, as during the 1960s, several countries were experimenting with thorium-based reactors, such as the one which was being tested at the Indian Point Energy Center in Buchanan, New York. But, as does tend to happen when humans f*** around to find out, the operation of the uranium plant led to radiological contamination of the area. How close are we to my final stop? Okay, so, here's where we are, and there's my stop. That's actually quite a bit of distance. My granted, ain't going to take no two hours and 11 minutes. Because again, Google Maps thinks I'm going to go all the way back the way I came and follow some actual roads instead of the hiking trail. Damn, look at that. That tree is about four times as wide as I am. I would go over there and take a photo in front of it to uh, demonstrate, but that would require walking through more spider webs than I'm comfortable with. I've also got a slight situation. Uh. Seems I managed to pass my uh, last set of coordinates about half an hour ago. <sighs> half an hour ago I was passing a rock face. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> I think I just inhaled a gnat. <coughs> yep. Evidently there's only three ways for me to get back to my or get to my last uh, set of coordinates and one is to climb a rock face another one is to go on either side of the rock face follow one of the streams that are coming in off the river and hope that it leads somewhere uphill or three you might have seen on the map that there was a another trail that goes to that set of coordinates I just have to get out on the road somewhere in the car and <clears throat> find my way into that uh, location uh, <clears throat> by road. <coughs> mm. So, nothing to do now but double back. And I'm kind of disappointed hearing something behind me besides that boat. <laughs> Motorboat. <laughs> Anyways. Um, yeah. This right here, only taller, is what was standing between me and my final set of coordinates. Yeah, more like that up there. I do stand rather disappointed. I came out here to show you the ruins of a town raised by the government after they stole the land away from the people that lived there just to build a weapons plant. And all I've got to show for it is two small cemeteries 
and a lot of hiking. Well, hopefully the documentary segment of this video will make up for that lack of visual representation. If not, so sorry. I did my best. <clears throat> Fuzz. <laughs> But, <clears throat> right now, in order to make it back to my car before dark, I'm going to have to backtrack along the trail that I took in here. Because if I try to take the Katy Trail down to where I can access 94 and then hike along 94 back, it's going to take several hours, it'll be well after dark, and in the meantime, I'm liable to get picked up by the police for walking along a highway, and then have to play 20 questions as to why uh, somebody who's legally carrying with a concealed license happens to be carrying. And that's just a bunch of drama that I don't feel like going through right now. So, I'm going to cut it for now. When I get to the trail, I'm going to set up the uh, headband mount. And we'll just uh, hike that trail back to the car. <sighs> With a fresh battery as well. Because I know this one won't last the entire time. In the meantime, i got to sit down here, dig through my bag, <clears throat> get some cough drops out. Oh, let's do our thing. The uranium plant ceased operations in 1966. Evidently not understanding the magnitude of the radiological contamination they had caused, on December 31, 1967, the Atomic Energy Commission returned control of the facility to the U.S. Army in order to convert it into a production plant for defoliants, or what you and I would think of as herbicides on crack. Probably Agent Orange, which was frequently used during America's time in the Vietnam conflict. Mixed with dioxin and administered to jungle flora, this chemical cocktail could rapidly kill off trees and foliage, leaving little in the way of cover and concealment for soldiers who were specially trained in jungle warfare. Luckily, this defoliant project was scrapped before it ever made it off the drawing board, and the Army transferred 50-plus acres of irradiated lands back to the Atomic Energy Commission, while retaining control of the chemical plant itself. Due to the radiological contamination, the AEC and the U.S. Department of Energy maintained control over the site, including that of the chemical plant, from 1968 through 1985. And although the Army did make efforts to repair and decontaminate the chemical plant, in 1984 they transferred full custody of the plant to the Department of Energy. It was then that the Department of Energy declared decontamination and cleanup of the site a major environmental remediation project. This is where the Weldon Spring Quarry comes into play. The quarry was originally used to source limestone aggregate for the construction of the ordnance works, saving both time and money by sourcing building materials locally, rather than having to purchase and then ship them in. But after the plant was completed, the quarry was then used as a disposal site and burn pit for the byproducts of TNT and DNT production, leading to the area's nitroaromatic contamination. In 1958, the Army transferred control of the quarry to the Atomic Energy Commission, who then used it from 1959 to 1966 as a disposal site for uranium, thorium, and radium residues from the chemical plant, both barreled and uncontained, as well as contaminated rubble, equipment, and soil from the demolition of a former uranium processing plant located in St. Louis, Missouri. As nearly as I can tell, but don't quote me on this, this is what I believe eventually became the Weldon Spring Uranium Disposal Site, 
which would later become the Weldon Springs Site Interpretive Center, which is a massive containment structure built atop a radioactive disposal pit, which was gradually filled up during the many years of environmental remediation and cleanup. 700 plus farmers, businessmen, teachers, and their families, forced from their homes, their lands taken, their towns destroyed, their lands contaminated, promises made, promises broken, all to feed a global conflict that need not have even happened. So many dreams shattered, so many lives forever changed, so many lies stamped with official seals of approval, and so many whispers of the past struggling to be heard even today over the hustle and bustle of the modern men and women who pass to and fro on Highway 94, unaware or unconcerned with the voices of yesterday, desperate to tell their stories to any who are willing to stop for just a moment and listen. All right, let's go, bitches. No, that requires crossing a fence. I ain't doing that. I don't remember slogging through this much mud. I think I followed that little trail over there the first time through.
bitch be tripping. I would love to, but my back is killing me. I'm overdue for the chiropractor, something fierce. So, I made it back to the uh, Hamburg Lost Valley uh, trail loop. <sighs> and we're gonna head back to the mothership, get the hell out of here, go get some groceries and head home. Actually, I don't think I need the groceries until like Monday, so I can pick them up then. <sighs> so, we'll see you when we get there. <sighs> Well guys, that's it for now. Sorry I didn't find the ruins that I promised. Then again, the articles that I, uh, I found the information on are A, old, and B, they also point out that you have to go in the uh, very early spring where all the vegetation hasn't grown in yet. Or, ooh, another tick. <gasps> they have not stopped trying. And another. Holy shit, they are tenacious. <sighs> yeah. Anyways, like I was saying, what was I saying? Uh, the article was both very old and it did specify you have to be here in the very early spring or late autumn in order to find the places. So, hence my not actually finding any ruins for you. Um, now, even though this is part two of two, I'm not done yet. Um, it's not how, 
or sorry, it's not Hamburg, but um, you remember in the first video that lady that I spoke to pointed out that if you go across the water, you're going to go up a road and find some foundations. Uh, if I'm reading these maps correctly, those foundations are actually outbuildings for the old DNT uh, or whatever it was. Um, quarry that supported the ordnance works and when they shut everything down they flooded the quarry so now it's actually a little lake but the foundations are still there they even show up on the satellite maps so I'll be heading up there in a future video to check that out and check out a couple other things that I want to see up here in the meantime thanks for checking out this video thanks for checking out the first one and I hope you got some sort of enjoyment out of it, at least some sort of entertainment value of some sort. <laughs> I'm Tommy the Tubby Explorer. Thanks for checking out Tubby's Explorations. If you haven't already, hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. I've got some really juicy paranormal stuff coming up in uh, June here. And shoot. Keep checking back. Hit that notification bell so you uh, don't miss out on what's coming up. So, yeah. I'm going to head home and uh, recover. <laughs> so, in the meantime, get out there. See what you can see. And to all my fellow tubbies, get up and move. It's worth it. Skaters. See ya.